Well, let's go ahead and get started with our webinar today. Uh, today, we are going to talk about Air Quality 2.0, what is next? Shaping IAQ now and into the future. And if you can see from our opening slide, we have three expert panelists. We will introduce them in a moment. We do want to thank our sponsor, Innova Nanojet, and we'll have a short commercial before we get into our content today from Innova Nanojet to talk about their technology. But today's topic is very important. We think about air quality, the buildings you manage or the facilities you run. What can you do, perhaps on a limited budget, to improve the air quality for those that use your buildings? And we will have time at the end of our presentation to ask questions as well. So uh, we look forward to getting your thoughts and especially the thoughts from our expert panelists. So as we move on into the webinar, as I mentioned in my chat comment and verbally a moment ago, I'm Jeff Cross, the media director for ISSA. Assisting today on the webinar is Martha Schmidt. She's the ISSA virtual events producer. She handles all the back end stuff and if something happens, she'll fix it. That's what I've been told anyway. Kathleen Misovic is the CMM managing editor. That's what this webinar is brought to you by CMM and our sponsor as well. But Cleaning and Maintenance Management Magazine is your magazine for the industry. You can receive it in print and digital format at cmmonline.com. You can see all the archives or current content there at any time. So if you're not a subscriber, don't tell anybody that, but be sure to go to the website and get your copy of CMM Magazine. So as we see more coming into the webinar, we have several hundred re uh, registered for this. But before we get started, again, Use the Q&A to ask questions. Use the chat feature. Kathleen will be watching that and copying down some questions that we can ask at the end of our webinar. You'll receive a copy of this. Anyone who registered, whether you're here or not, you'll get an email probably next week with a recording included in that. So feel free to watch it again, share it with colleagues, use it as you wish. You are muted, so no need to worry about that. Uh, you're muted to prevent any background noise. And if you miss the email that goes out, this will also be on our website, cmmonline.com. You'll be able to find the webinar there. Want to mention that ISSA is here for you as a trade association. We're the Worldwide Cleaning Industry Association. We have several divisions. If you are a member, we thank you for that. But if you're not yet, go to issa.com or even easier, email membership at issa.com. And we'll be we'll get back to you on the member benefits you can enjoy along with the onboarding process. But everyone in the industry should be an ISSA member. And let's get our first sponsor message on screen. We thank Innova and Nanojet for their sponsorship. At Innova Nanojet Technologies, we specialize in developing ultrafine droplet spray systems for ultrafast cleaning indoor air. Setting new standards in clean and healthy living for homes and public indoor spaces. Effectively remove airborne pollutants in your space using only water. Our nanojet spray can be used around people and doesn't cause any damage to sensitive materials or electronic devices. Visit our website to discover how you can achieve clean air for life with Innova Nanojet Technologies. So let's talk about our panelists today. We have Bethany Uribe, the Division Manager, Manager for ASAP Restoration. Bethany, welcome to the webinar. Glad to have you. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your company. Um, so again, I am the Division Manager here, so I oversee anything that has to do with like mitigation, mold, asbestos, anything more on the environmental side of it. Um, you know, every day to day, it's a it's same problem, but different scenario, right? And that's what it really comes down to is um, I live here in Arizona and everybody's misconception is that, you know, it's hot, it'll take care of itself. And today I think we'll see that that's not the case. Thank you for that. And no bragging about the wonderful weather you're enjoying compared to cold, dark Ohio where I'm from. That's why it looks like I'm in a shadow here. The sun will not come out. So Bethany, thank you for joining us today. Next, we have Dr. John McCune. He's the principal of IA, I Air Group, and John is based in Ireland. John, tell us a little bit about your expertise as well. Yeah, thank you, Jeff, for having us. Uh, great opportunity to speak to your audience, um, and I won't have any jokes about the weather because I'm calling from Dublin in Ireland, so you can imagine what it's like. Um, I'm a, an ER physician by my background training, but I got very curious about the connection between the built environment and health outcomes, initially with regards to kids with asthma and allergy, 
So we have a certification program where we test consumer products, cleaning products, air filters, textile products, building materials, how they can be a good choice for people with asthma and allergies trying to optimize the indoor environment. And we run a certification program in the US with our educational partners, the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America. And that program has been running about 10 years. In the last five years and accelerated by the pandemic, we've got more into the air, into the area of the indoor environment as a whole. And the iAir group stands for Indoor Air Innovation and Research. And that's the logo you'll see behind me is our research institute, where we're looking at a lot of studies on the impact of the built environment, not just people with asthma and allergies, but everybody who's interested in optimizing the indoor environment for health and wellness. Thank you, Dr. McCune. And Doug Hoffman with Normie. Doug, we go way back, but tell us a little bit about yourself as well. Hey, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. John. That was a good segue for me because I came out of the construction industry uh, back in uh, about 35 years. I was in the construction industry. We were building uh, unhealthy homes, didn't know it. Uh, but I decided in 1996, when I got into the indoor air quality side of the industry, that I was going to spend the rest of my life fixing those problems. So we started NORMI, National Organization of Remediators and Microbial Inspectors, in 2004 as a licensing or training organization for the states that require licensing. We do a lot of training on indoor air quality. I always say the only people who need the solutions we suggest are people who breathe. Big market. <laughs> so uh, really happy to be here. Thank you, Jeff, for inviting me. I love talking about indoor air quality. Um, it seems like the last few years it's become a thing, but it's always been a thing with us. So thanks for the opportunity. Absolutely. And we'll go about an hour for those on our webinar. Um, might go a few minutes over time because we want to cover all of our slides, but we will go quickly through them. We want to have a few minutes at the end for the questions. So let's move on into our presentation. And this can be done anytime in our webinar today. So for everyone here, think about what you'd like to learn. Put it in the chat if you'd like us to see that. Ask questions. And we're all watching that chat feature. So we'll see your thoughts as we go through the presentation. All right, so let's do this. Let's start with some opening statements. Why is indoor air quality important to you? And what's your vision and mission regarding indoor air quality? And we're going to go with ladies first. Bethany, let's start with you. I mean, the biggest thing about indoor air quality is, is like they were saying, it it affects everybody. And it's one of those things that you can't necessarily see, right? So the biggest thing when going into any of this is, are we taking care of things, you know, um, not only for ourselves, but the people that work for us? Um, what I want to see is just a better way to do that. Uh, even in my industry, we use things like ozones, like it's been mentioned. And it's just not always, it might not be the best way to do things anymore, you know, like, building houses back in the day that looked great, but probably weren't using the best materials. So I would like to see a better vision going forward of how we can do it in a more safer process. Thank you. And Doug, what, what would you add to that? I think that's right. I, the We always look at the idea of, of the built environment being able to create cleaner, safer, healthier environments. And what's interesting to me is, be, especially being a builder, it's not so much about how much money you spend, it's the choices that you make and the products that you use. And uh, you can build a, a healthier <laughs> home by just simply making simple decisions and making the correct decisions. So that's gonna improve the indoor air quality. As Bethany said, we're always concerned about how the built environment is actually being connected to the person's health. We fix buildings, not people. But there's definitely a, a, a connection there, and we love working with the medical professionals who understand that and realize they can't give their, their uh, patients a pill and send them back to a bad environment. So uh, it, it's huge. I think it's uh, becoming a bigger and bigger issue because of the way we build. Agreed. And John, wrap it up for us on this one. Yeah, well, I'd like to build on what, on what uh, Doug said there, that if you think about it in, in the U.S., you're spending about 20% of your GDP on healthcare, and that's access to physicians, it's tablets, and it's treating downstream consequences of illness. And we know we spend 80% of our time indoors, and we know all the research about indoor air pollution being four to five times more polluted than, than outdoor air. 
And many of the impacts of determinants of health are our environments, our communities, but also our buildings. So I love opportunities like this to speak to people who are related to the, the built environment, whether it's design, construction, or maintenance and cleaning. And to think about it that if I, as an emergency room physician at the very red end, the very reactive acute end of the medical spectrum, and as you come down, you've got your family doctor, your nurses, your dietitian, your exercise people, your meditation, your yoga. But if you keep dumbing, going down that spectrum, ultimately you come to architects and people who design buildings because we know that they have that huge impact on health outcomes, that the research is there. So it's just to have a, a new opportunity to think again about how do we want to manage wellness, not treat illness, how do we stay well? And the role of our built environment and understanding how we clean it, how we ventilate it, how we maintain it is really part of that ongoing conversation. Nobody's going to figure out this health crisis on their own. It's going to take the architects, the designers, obviously the, the healthcare professionals, but it's going to take a bigger holistic a picture of how we live in society to do that and conversations like we're going to have today are very much part of that going forward appreciate that let's take a stroll down history lane a little bit and talk about this now doug you and i've had a conversation about what we've seen over the years i don't want to hazard a guess that to the ages of our panelists today but i know you and i have seen some things change and maybe those who are on our webinar as panelists or as attendees remember these days i remember in restaurants, you'd have a smoking and non-smoking section. And I don't remember airplanes having that, but I think that's been a thing in the past. But just things have changed with indoor air quality and the, and the focus on making things better. Doug, why don't you share some thoughts that you had that we talked about before? Yeah, thanks. I think the big shift for me was actually during the Carter administration when there was oil embargoes and, and uh, things got uh, very, very expensive, uh, similar to kind of what's been happening recently. But um, People were really concerned about energy costs, and so they were weather stripping their houses. Uh, we had jealousy windows in our house, and I remember us getting trying to find weather stripping to put between the glass so that we could, you know, keep the the house tighter. And I think what's what's interesting to me when I look back at uh, historically what's happened is we built our homes tighter and tighter and tighter. And there's not a problem with that if you know how to manage the the indoor air quality, but I think that that's what contributed to uh, building related illnesses, sick building syndrome, which really people started talking about in the 80s and then in the early 90s. And I think what we're dealing with today uh, started a long time ago, and there's been some major changes in, I think, the level of toxicity that we're seeing in houses. And as as Dr. John said, we're, we're in our houses all the time. We're in conditioned space, from our conditioned car to our conditioned school to our conditioned home, our conditioned church. We're constantly in conditioned uh, space. We don't spend a lot of time outside. That's a big change that's happened. And I think that's affected us uh, probably in a, in a very negative way. One of the cool things to me, uh, without going into a lot of detail at this point, but what's really cool to me is the dynamic nature of the solutions has changed so much in the last few years, and it continues to change. Every year, there's a there's better and better ways, I think, to deal with the issues that we're finding in the indoor environments. And John, what would you add to that? Thinking about what you've seen as a medical doctor over the years, obviously we see some improvement, but are you are you good with what you've seen? Um, I think one positive to come out of the pandemic is that people now have joined the dots with regards to air. Uh, I think Bethany was saying you, you can't see it, but now people have an emotional connection to indoor air quality what's become what was invisible is now visible people have connected look my indoor air quality my indoor environment in, impacts on, on my outcomes and we'll, we'll probably get into it a bit deeper a little bit later on but where i've seen from a physician point of view two big impacts is either very high-end grade a office buildings where it's become strategic hr to optimize indoor air quality because if people are going to go back to the office they want to have very good office space with good light not only iaq but ieq 
sound light ventilation access to good food and all those things and indoor air quality is part of that conversation if you want to retain talent the other big impact is underserved communities and obviously um doug will talk a lot about mold and issues like that that we're seeing kids with asthma and allergy and it's as a result of them bouncing into the emergency room getting treated but just like doug said at the beginning they then go back to the environment where the triggers are and we have done studies, interventional studies, where we've done cleaning, decluttering, very small remodeling, taking out pest remediation <laughs> and having big improvements there. So I think there's going to be a lot more research on impact of our environment, um, certainly around grade A offices in the top end, but also underserved communities and keeping people out of hospital by cleaning and maintaining better uh, underserved communities. Thank you. It looks like... Uh, I I might pronounce this name wrong. Gadiel Sanchez asks a couple of questions. Those are questions we're going to have in our presentation. So we will cover those questions. They'll be up in a, in a future slide. Now, Bethany, I know how old you are because you told me. So I know you've never seen smoking in a building, most likely unless you've been to Vegas or some certain spot. But what are your thoughts on this as far yeah. as what you've seen or heard? Or uh, if you were to grade improvement, what would you say? Um, yeah, I haven't seen a whole lot, to be honest. I mean, as far as I can remember, it was just uh, when they changed, like when you were allowed to smoke cigarettes in the car with like, um, you know, youth. Mm -hmm. So still a small contained area, um, whether you're rolling down a window or not, um, you know, coming from parents that and family members that did do it, uh, it doesn't really help, right? So just those little things, like they're saying that we're changing over time. Um, and like Dr. John was saying, we we have now connected it. It is now a bigger issue than what people really thought of in the beginning, because again, it comes back to not being seen. It really has to be seen in a different way for people that aren't in these industries to truly understand what is happening and why it's happening. Perfect. Let's talk about something very important. And Doug had mentioned it. Sick building syndrome is our next topic. So we're going to start with John on this. It's his turn to start. So here's our topic. What do you think, John? Are we still dealing with this? Is it a is it a phrase that's gone away or is it something that we still hear? I know BRI is another term. Sure. And it, and it is important to, to get definitions right because we're, we're kind of scientific scientists on call. Um, and you can loosely bucket into sick building syndrome is where people don't feel great in the building. It may correlate to going back on Monday mornings and things like that. It's just a general phase that building's not a great building to be in i get brain fog or i get headaches and it's just it's just kind of there's almost a, a psychological component to it that's but something's triggering it but we never identify it when you're talking to a building related illness you do find a pathogenic source and it could be um legionella and air conditioners and things like that so it is important that we know what, what we're talking about from a scientific basis because then you've got somebody like no that uh, like doug and his team can come in isolate the pathogen have a remediation plan and 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 do measure and audit and before and after um, but I suppose you could talk about the, the pandemic recently was a building related illness. There was an infectious pathogens that was in, in, in buildings. So that's one that's very top of mind. Um, so I don't think it's gone away. And I also think people are now much more educated about indoor air quality. And uh, there are monitors. I know we're going to talk about sensor technology and monitors and visual displays of monitoring. Um, and we know a lot of people on the call will be cleaning um, schools or they'll be cleaning workplaces or facilities manage those buildings. There is now a big duty of care for employers, not only to do it, to do the right thing in the building, I think we'll get onto ROI metrics a bit later on and strategic HR, but also to communicate those people uh, that those efforts have been done to your staff. So you don't allow something like a sick building syndrome uh, concept to take place because you, you're showing you're actually uh, doing best practice. But there are many other things that aren't just related to IAQ and air quality. Doug meant about material science, outgassing, VOCs, ventilation rate. So there is this concept of integrated building management, not just ventilation feels filtration, but also source control of chemicals, not only what we bring in in incidental furniture and design, but also then how, how we clean. So I think it is a, a big topic. People are engaged about it. They want to see sensors and they want to know what's going on in their building. So these, these phrases are going to become more and more um, part of common parlance as we go forward. 
Okay, very good. And Bethany, what would you add to this? I mean, I think the biggest thing with sick, sick building syndrome also is the fact that these symptoms that we have are, I mean, it could be anything, right? Like there's so basic symptoms from like fever to, um, you know, your stuffy nose, things like that, that it's hard to determine what it could possibly be. So I think Dr. John um, put on the fact that like you, you leave Friday and you're good and then you come back Monday and you're like, wow, this building, maybe it is the building. Maybe it's, I just don't want to be here. And that's when it comes to how do we determine that and how do we fix it, right? Like that is, that's going to be the big long-term thing is how do we determine it? How do we fix it? Because at the end of the day, it's just like having a cold. Absolutely. Makes sense. And Doug, wrap it up for us. Yeah. So we get calls, of course, all the time from, uh, especially facilities maintenance the director saying, I think I might have a sick building. That's a very common phrase. And it's interesting because it typically starts with at, maybe at the lunchroom, Judy talks to Barbara, who then talks to Dennis and who talks to Denise, and they all getting seem to be getting headaches and they're trying to figure out whether it's the boss. You know, <laughs> so the, the point is, is that I think when they start seeing this cluster of symptoms, that may be an indication that there is something going on uh, with the building. But I'm on this. I'm exactly with Dr. John on this idea of I always say it's a multifaceted problem, which takes a multi strategic solution. There are so many things when you talk about the built environment that need to be addressed. It's not just about coming in and taking a mold swab, you know, but it's actually looking at the building itself because you can create environments that are going to pre present problems for for the person. You just have to make that connection. And just like Bethany said, um, as I always say, uh, uh, prognosis without diagnosis is malpractice. You've got to know what the solution is. I mean, what the problem is before you have the solution. And that's what the assessment process is all about. Hmm. Don't say malpractice around John. He might not like that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's stick with you, Doug, on this next topic, because you sent me this picture. Now, this filter is very dirty. It's from the headquarters of Normie. <laughs> no, I got it from your house. Okay. Talk about this. And why is this important that we have this on screen? Yeah, I think one of the things that has been kind of a, a misunderstanding about filters, and I see it all the time, is a lot of, of the mechanical contractors now are utilizing a four inch or larger filters, four inches thick pleated filters. And unfortunately, a lot of times, especially in the home environments, they think that they can leave them there for a year. And the truth is, is that because of bio nesting and other issues that are going on, those filters can actually grow uh, bacteria and mold. And this particular picture is a filter that I just took a picture of just a couple of days ago. That's why I sent it to you. And this is actually out of a house where they pulled the filter out and you can see the mold growing all over it. And even on the back side of the pleats, it's actually growing. So I think the, the addressing the filters is an important step. It's always got to be, you've got to deal with the filter. You've also got to deal with proactive air purification technologies. But the point is, is that if the filters aren't replaced, you're going to have very a lot of big issues. And so we, we always tell people, you really need to replace these at least every 90 days. And that's if that filter has an antimicrobial on it. Um, most people wait until it's loaded, quote unquote. And, uh, and by that time, it's actually be, maybe become part of the problem. You know, Doug, when you sent this, I saw a dirty filter, but you're commenting on that there's mold all over it, and then we're pushing air through it. In, I mean, that's what they're breathing. Yeah. What a terrible scenario. John, what do you think about this? Yeah, I, I mean, I think one of the things that's come up and has already come up in, in the chat I see is return on investment. If, if I have a healthy building approach, it's going to cost money. Can I get, you know, a hard ROI metric on that? Um. And it's unusual that people feel you can break this down into just a single financial metric. I know we're all in business, we need to be accountable. But if you were to do a healthy building audit on a building that's actually got what Doug has shown here, you probably find your energy audit that just replacing these filters, you're going to save a whole lot of money because these need to be replaced anyway. So you will save your money. People feel this investment, this proactive investment in a healthy building will, will cost me money. But you'll actually find going around and doing just an airflow audit, you're going to save money anyway. But if you look at anybody broadly running a business, your energy costs, your ventilation costs in a condition space, maybe about 10% of your business overheads. 
Um, and if you say, say 20% of that 10%, that's 2% of your saving. But 50% of your overhead is your people. And if suddenly those people in your office are now getting headaches and all the things we spoke about, about uh, decreasing airflow to hit energy goals, you've got 50% of your overhead. And most people are knowledge workers now. We're in the information age. We're not pulling levers in Victorian factories. We're all thinking and creating. So you really want those people working at their optimum. So both, you know, sometimes people say, well, that's the soft metrics, that's people and how they feel. No, that's a hard business metric to having your people well and productive and working well. And the hard metric of your energy cost saving, I think that's more of a soft metric. So people do look about what's a hard metric, an ROI and a soft metric. People just feel better. I would put it the other way around. If your people are feeling better because they don't have filters like this, that's a hard, good business metric and a good business decision. Um, and also you have uh, people being sick and all that stuff, which, again, are more hard business metrics. So. That, that's what I would say. The takeaway from this is healthy people is a good investment in your business. That's where the money is spent. You're right. Good points. And Bethany, anything to add before we move on? Yeah, just a quick thing, too, is that, I mean, not only has Dr. John saying, you got to think about what is it going to happen long term? Like, are you going to have issues where you have to do remediation, constantly sanitizing your ducts? Like, that's going to cost you more money in the end, too. So there are other things on the back end. We're trying to take care of the problem later down on the road instead of dealing with it on the forefront that you probably just don't want to get into. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Our next slide is the big one that everyone wants to talk about. I know we'll have this topic and in a few slides, another one similar, but monitoring the air, you know, some questions in the chat have been about what can we use? What are some devices, technology? And I know from my conversations with people, they want to be able to check the air quality like they do the weather forecast or, or what's going on outside with air quality. I know that's available to most, but let's start with you, John, on this. I think it's your turn to start. I'm losing track, but maybe it's your turn. What do you think? What can we use? What's practical here? Yeah, it, this is a bit complicated area. I'm on the Environmental Health Committee for ASHRAE. So we've done a lot of work in this area. You do... It's, it's not a simple traffic light. It's gone red, everybody else. It's gone you know, green and, and, and orange or whatever. You've got to look at how many people are in a space. You've got to look what the activities are happening in that space. So it's a little bit more complicated than, than simple uh, traffic light systems. Um, but I think it's an excellent idea to have data. We all in business, what gets measured, what gets managed. You have a feedback loop. You can change behaviors. If we have a wearable or we're tracking our steps and and numbers people love numbers and they love to look at trends so i think the fact that you have measurement and you start monitoring elevates the conversation uh, it stops some of the confusion yes there may be a risk that you're now going to bring some debate that you could have maybe hidden and maybe you would have got away with it i don't think you'll get away with it long term and it's not the right thing to do so i'm in favor of the concept of measuring uh, you can have very simple measures like co2 which is just a proxy of air exchange and how many people are in there it's a very blunt instrument but at least it's a start and it's very um it can be low cost and easy to, to have. Um, but I think you need to do it in a coordinated way. I'm not a building engineer, building management scientist. I describe myself as the why guy. I know why it's important. The hows I'd leave to people like Doug and, and Bethany. Um, but I'm, I'm in favor of broadening the conversation and having measurement and numbers begins that dialogue to take place. Okay, very good. And Bethany, let's get your thought. <clears throat> I mean, I do think that this is a big topic and it needs to be studied um, quite a bit, to be honest, to make something that's going to be effective for each and every home, right? Because no, just like no person is the same, no home is the same. Um, like Don, Dr. John is touching on, um, the difference in where you are, I mean, even in the world, in the state, if you're next to water or not like there's so many different factors that are going to play into this and what can change the air quality drastically whether it's in a, an office building or even your home car things like that so when we're going out and we're doing tests and we do you know pre-testing post-testing for jobs that we do day in day out the the reason why we do a baseline each time is because of those factors. We need to know what is native to the area. We need to know 
what is around here to where what actually is normal for this specific location. So I think further technology in this is going to be amazing, mm -hmm. but it's definitely going to take a lot of time and effort and trying to figure out what is, you know, accurate. Thank you for that. Now, Doug, I've been with you at many trade shows and I've seen you test the air. I've seen you at your booth at ISSA show, showing us that the air we're breathing and thankfully it was good at that time. So a question we have uh, from Gadiel, I'd like you to address. Are there devices that show this qual air quality and what's the cost? Because people want to know what can I get and what's it going to cost me? Can you address that for us? I can. And uh, let me just first underscore what uh, Dr. John and Bethany said. Uh, we don't get poor air quality overnight just like we don't get high blood pressure overnight. Uh, typically it's over a long period of time. And so being able to monitor it and find out what's going on and, and see those trends and be able to fix something uh, before it becomes a problem seems pretty smart to me. I mean, that's the whole concept of indoor air quality management is managing that environment. And I've had monitors in my house, Jeff, as you know, for about seven or eight years. Um, and so we know a lot about uh, about those and they can be bought very inexpensively now uh, and actually with a Wi-Fi connection so you can see the, the results on your phone. I have one that costs about $300 that I have in my house. And when I'm out of town, I know when my wife turns the thermostat up or down, you know, I can, I can see it from there and I can see if there's CO2, if there's extra folks in the house because she's having a, a Bible study or something. So I think being able to monitor several different parameters uh, and understand that there are limits. I mean, you want to stay within certain uh, guidelines to make sure that you're as, as good as you can be in the environment. As Bethany said, every environment's different. Uh, my house, my wife and I live in, in our house. If I sold my house to a family of six with two dogs and a cat, the indoor air quality would change immediately. So it's not just about the house, just about the built environment. It's about the way people live in that environment. And I, my, from my perspective, monitoring is just not that expensive. And it gives you, I think, the same kind of security that you feel as if you're checking your blood pressure periodically or checking your cholesterol periodically. It's just staying on top of a potential problem before it becomes one. Very good. So from what I, what I heard there is it's gonna cost some money, but it's not gonna be tremendously expensive. But more important, and to John's previous point, if you keep your people healthy, you're going to save money anyway because you'll have less absenteeism. I think Is that's that right, Jeff. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you where I think we're going. I we've got some monitors now, commercial monitors, where you could walk into the uh, classroom and see the air quality projected on a television screen, or go into a, a hospital and in the lobby see a giant television screen. A screen that tells you that the air quality in that environment is is good. That's where we're headed. I know everyone on our webinar today may have more questions, such as what you just mentioned, Doug, about that. So I know all three of you are willing to follow up with people, but these are good questions, and that would be great to see to to walk in and see that information. It's coming. Would you agree? It's coming. To Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely, it's coming. It's already here. Mm -hmm. We've got monitoring programs now that you can put. You can do exactly that thing. Yeah, Daniel just said that it's already here. I don't see it too often myself, but maybe I need to open my eyes when I walk into a building. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to start paying more attention and I'll report back on what I see. Let's move on to our next point. Here's a question for the uh, webinar attendees. Just to get a take a temperature, when you think about the importance of indoor quality for your staff and the buildings you maintain, what you hear, what you know about with your buildings, is it not important, very important, or somewhere in between? Just give us a, a grade there as we go through this. I know you can do this anytime in our, the rest of our webinar, but is it a one, a 10, or a five? Uh, I hope it's a 10 because we should really be paying attention to the indoor quality of our buildings. So let's move on to our next point. And talk about older buildings. Now, I think this is important because you think of modern buildings, you may be able to retrofit some things or work with the ventilation systems. What about these old buildings like in schools, maybe some older hospitals? And uh, let's start with you, Bethany, on this. Any thoughts on what can be done? I mean, this is definitely a harder topic just because when it comes to older buildings, there's more than 
just ventilation, right? Like you have to deal with the fact of when it was built, are there other building materials that we're going to disturb while we're trying to make these changes? So I think this one, to be honest, I'm going to probably hand over more to Doug and John. I think that there's a little bit more that goes into this than just changing ventilation. And <laughs> to be totally upfront, older buildings, I know a lot about asbestos and how to deal with them all, but changing ventilation, I think, will be up to them. <laughs> Well, Doug's already admitted that he's built some buildings that maybe weren't the best thinking about health. Doug, you've admitted that. I have. I'm what guilty. do you say to this topic? I'm guilty. <laughs> <laughs> well, the uh, the indoor environment is constantly changing. Um, as we walk in and out, we're bringing in contaminants behind us, swirling that in like pig pen. And uh, the way we use our environments, obviously, uh, are are being affected by or the air quality is being affected that way. But I think one of the biggest issue with older buildings, and we have a lot of them in, in New Orleans, as you can imagine, is air infiltration and moisture intrusion problems. Uh, those environments, those built environments are not uh, sealed like they should, should be sealed properly. And you can, it's good to have ventilation, but you don't want it through the walls. If you want to be able to control the ventilation, have it come in through a place where it can be controlled, filtered, purified, and so forth. And that helps, of course, with uh, dilution and diluting the problems that are that are in the environment. But uh, I'm very optimistic, and and maybe I'm a little Pollyannish about this. I don't think I've ever seen a building that couldn't be improved. So I'm very confident about retrofitting. Uh, new, you just again just have to know what the problems are, and maybe it's because I'm a builder. You have to know what the problems are and and uh, fix those problems. We work on a lot of houses that are over a hundred years old in New Orleans. And uh, it can be addressed. All right, very good. And John, anything to add? Yeah, I, I think this is a fascinating subject. Um, I mean, the, the the picture of the building you have there looks like an old stone building, good ventilation. Um, certainly in the Victorian times in, in the UK and in Ireland, we had pandemics like TB and things like that. So we built pretty well ventilated buildings, big classrooms, uh, high windows you'll see in old Victorian buildings. And, and even, say, in, in South Parts of America, where Doug is from, the buildings were naturally ventilated. They had, um, they, had uh, they, they built buildings that were sensitive to the local environment, the microclimate. You know, the kitchen north facing didn't get heated. Um, so I think the older buildings actually are naturally ventilated and have some positive things and have actually good uh, indoor air quality often. Um, again, air quality isn't just uh, filtration, it is ventilation and it's uh, avoiding uh, it's source and buildup. I saw some chats in the chat scroll there, a couple of really good points. One is about, you're right, you can't just put in MERV filters and HEPA filters into old building systems, particularly the, the ventilation systems, they can't take it. Um, so you've got to have novel air cleaning technologies. And also you've got to be cognizant of the outdoor environment. There's there's a comment on the chat there about that, about adverse weather events, uh, forest fires, longer allergy seasons, pollen seasons. So there, there, is, there is a lot that goes into, into this. I think what people don't want is what you'll see, say, in Vegas, where we spend a lot of time, is a big glass box in the middle of the desert, a lot of solar gain. So all the the, um, the HVAC has to be cranked up and air conditioned. And they're just not nice places to be because um, the HVAC is always boiling hot or freezing down. So this is a huge subject. And again, I'm not an architect, I'm not a designer, I'm not a construction professional, but I don't think necessarily an old building means bad air quality. And again, it's indoor environmental quality we want. And also don't forget that some of the, uh, sorry, not some, large portions of the emergency school fund around the pandemic, one state sent back 80 million pounds because they, they didn't know how to spend the money. And I think there's more education around what we're talking about. It isn't just changing HVAC, HVAC system. Maybe it's taking some of that school funding for Inflation Reduction Act and Resilient Building Challenge and improving cleaning protocols and not having buildup of VOCs when we're cleaning. So the people on this conversation. So when we think about indoor air quality, it's so many more things uh, than just old buildings bad or whatever. It, it's, it's, it's how we manage the buildings and how we operate the buildings. Very fair. Appreciate that. I do want to mention our poll results that popped up here. Uh, the majority said that's a big concern. The importance of inner quality is extremely important. 
40% said it was. A few were in the middle. Uh, there are the results. Eight, seven, six. Only one said it wasn't. A couple said it wasn't. But I think we see the majority agree that the indoor quality the, and the talking about the discussions are important. So appreciate that uh, poll there, Martha. As we think about this next topic is something we've talked about a bit. So what I'd like is just a quick statement from each of you. If you were to, in a couple of sentences, describe the building of the future that you would like to see, what would that look like? And let's start with you, Doug, on this. I'm very Quickly, excited. Doug. Yeah, I'm very, I'm very excited about smart buildings. I, I was just in a building yesterday, a church building, and that's a great example of a building that that they're not controlling the uh, uh, air conditioning system. It's used four hours a week, and they've and they've got an oversized air conditioning system that needs to be running. And so I think having smart buildings in the future is going to be the the answer to a lot of these issues because again, it's constantly monitoring and turning the units on and off when they're actually needed rather mm -hmm. than just letting them run all the time. Makes sense. And Bethany, what do you think? I love that technology is getting integrated into this more and more because as the younger generation, I mean, we don't go anywhere without being connected to something. Um, being able to truly like see and monitor even from apps or connected to, you know, Alexa or Google or Siri, whatever it may be, having that capacity to be able to see it constantly you know if you're taking a vacation and oh did I leave the AC running well I can take care of that or it's only going to run if I'm gone for a month it's only going to run when it needs to I think that having that integrated in is going to change efficiency across the board right the amount of power we're using the amount of um, just overall air quality to be honest perfect and John, wrap this one up for us. Yeah, well, I think I've told you this one, Jeff, but it's, my, it's one of my favorite ones that people think smart just means intelligent or clever, but smart actually means sensing, monitoring, and real-time feedback. It came from the software industry. So when something is smart, it's sensing, monitoring, and you're getting a feedback loop. And that, that's what we want to see. I think a, a smart building of the future is planet friendly, it's energy conscious, it's sustainable, it's not just burning loads of AC because you built it with solar gain. I think we're going to try and have to build buildings that are sensitive to microclimates, where, where they are and what part of the country and so forth. But not only planet friendly, they're also people friendly. And um, so we're using, if possible, natural ventilation. One of the comments on the chat talks about zonal heating of buildings and zonal air cleaning of buildings. We're not just having a central HVAC uh, burning all the time. So I think I think it's really building um, with a purpose and being sensitive to the planet and sensitive to people and having really healthy buildings where people can go to work, people can go to school and really thrive in the indoor environment. Very good. All right, let's 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 do this. Let's go on to our next topic and just see if you have a thought here. Um, what are some practical steps that those watching can do? Thinking about limited budgets, but they're here. They're giving up an hour of their day. What are some things they can do right now, easy, with cost in mind? And um, John, let's start with you on this and just see if you have a thought. Yeah, I think I think a lot of people on on this call, first of all, they're on the call and they're getting educated. They're understanding that cleaning isn't just cleaning for appearance and it's not just the washrooms and those type of things. Cleaning and facilities management is now strategic HR. Uh, it's attracting talent as part of your HR strategy in your company or as part of your health and wellness strategy if you're talking about your home. Um, so I think that's a big, a big breakthrough in the paradigm and the mindset. And then the other thing, I think a lot of people now for ESG and sustainability and eco cleaning are doing a lot of investment in that area. And that's excellent. But think about, OK, how can I now get an additional return on investment on my eco-friendly strategies to make sure they're healthy strategies as well? And there's extend the paradigm from sustainability to health and wellness. Thank you. And Doug, what do you have to add? Well, I'm going to sound really old, uh, but when I was young, we uh, cleaned our house twice a year and it was a spring and a fall cleaning and it was taking everything out of the house cleaning it and taking it back in the house. 
Uh, I do a training, a free training for Habitat for Humanities every year. In fact, I've got another one coming up uh, in a couple of weeks. And one of the things that I talk about to these brand new homeowners is how important cleaning is and keeping keeping uh, clutter decluttered and so forth. So we have a document that I'll be glad to make available. I'm going to put it in the chat if that's okay. It mm -hmm. comes out of my book called 36 Steps to a Cleaner Environment. Very simple things that can be done. It's, a lot of it is just being aware of what's actually causing the contamination. And uh, maybe that will help some folks think differently about the way they keep their environments clean. Thank you, Doug. Yeah, put that in the chat. And John, if you have something to add there as well, some resources, links, whatever you'd like. And uh, sure. Bethany, any thoughts to this topic you'd like to add? Honestly, I think they said it very well. And, you know, okay. you can take things back into your home and use, you know, like the smaller air purifiers, things like that. If you don't have great ventilation, like if you're in an apartment, you can't make those changes, um, you know, to the building itself. Do the little things that you can for, you know, yourself, your family, um, like air purifiers, cleaning, even baseboards. I mean, people forget those all the time and it collects so much dust. So just the little things. Yes. Very good. Yeah, uh, one Doug, of the questions um, in the chat is about carpet cleaning. I've just, just put it in the chat there. We we actually, with, with your colleagues at GBAC and ISSA, mm -hmm. developed uh, an educational program around uh, cleaning and maintenance strategies for uh, facilities managers. Uh, so I put it in that. I put it in the show notes as well. And we have a we have a discount, a special discount for your members. But I would list, I would like to add to what, what Doug said. I think it's a really important thing. The traditional spring clean, we would do that in Ireland as well. And we 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 bring items outside, hopefully not getting allergens on them, but the power of natural sunlight and opening curtains, decluttering. And it, it sounds so old world, but it's it's so fundamental about removing dust buildup where we sealed our buildings over the over the winter period, the Christmas period. We may have had candles, we may have had fires, and to have that kind of traditional spring clean that the family get involved with and decluttering and throwing at old things and recycling. I think that's just a great mindset to bring to this um, rejuvenation and staying healthy in the built environment. And I, I love that. And then also somebody in the chat mentioned about, about carpets and fixed carpets. That is a big issue. And we've published a lot of research on that and I'll put it in the show notes. Um, but steam cleaning carpets, deep cleaning, hot water extraction, making sure they don't stay wet because they'll get moldy, as I'm sure Doug will tell you. But I think the power of steam and steam cleaning um, is something that we don't use enough for well. Again, it's an old traditional thing, reducing a uh, chemical burden and using the power of steam in that traditional spring clean as well. I think is something that's really important. Agreed, uh, John. And, you know, that's my background, carpet and upholstery care, cleaning fabrics. And we can't forget that. It's an old cliche that the carpet is the biggest filter in the building if you have carpet. And what do you do with filters, Doug? What do you do? You throw them away. No, no, no. <laughs> yes. Or, or? Keep them clean. <laughs> keep them clean. Yeah. So just, you know, the, there's some common sense stuff that plays into this as well. As Lee just mentioned, good vacuuming is important. Uh, I think Bethany mentioned the baseboards. Clean means more, a better health. And indoor quality is important when you think about the entire building and what impacts it could be from the floors or what's brought in. Let's do this. Let's go to our Q&A part. Martha, if you want to stop the slide presentation, um, we have several questions. We have so many. And those on our webinar today, there should be some follow up or you can email me, jeffcross at issa.com if you have a specific question you'd like to see addressed uh, that we haven't done today. And I will funnel those off to our panelists or you could reach them directly. But this first question is like the first one we got when we started promoting this webinar. So Doug, I think this may be mainly for you and I have no idea what this is about. So here it is. Don't look so surprised. You know what's coming. Can you address upgrading filter design for edge sealing to eliminate edge bypass flow? Yes. One of oh. the, uh, <laughs> thank you. One of the uh, things that we talk about when we talk about filters is what we is termed a blow by. You take a cardboard filter and you saw one, the picture of one, you take a cardboard filter and put it in a grill you can typically move it around. It just does not seal very around, uh, very good around the edges. And if you take that filter out and run your finger around the grill uh, where that sits, you're gonna find all kinds of stuff. Well, where is that going? It's going around the filter and then onto the A-coil into the air conditioning system. And of course, an air conditioning system is primarily dehumidifying, which means you're taking the most moist air in any environment and you're sending it right to the filter. 
to the egg coil where it's wet. And now you're collecting mold spores and dead skin cells, organic material that the mold can eat. So that blow by, the way you can resolve that is to make sure that you've got a filter that fits into that, uh, into that opening. And I think I suggested to you that, uh, that, that we, we talk about the perfect fit filter because it's an internal frame, has no cardboard, has an antimicrobial on the back of it. So there are technologies out there, new, new filters that will actually seal that and keep it from uh, that blow by experience that most of us see. Very good. That makes sense. Yeah, that question was definitely a builder question, maybe. I don't know. But uh, well, well said. Here's another question. Um, I do want to address one quick thing in the chat. I think it's pronounced Gianni. If I said that wrong, I apologize. Why never use low moisture? I think as long as you clean and get it, get the soil out, that's the big picture. So there are a lot of low moisture cleaning systems that do that. So uh, John mentioned steam cleaning. Uh, that's probably the more recognized and more commonly used method of flushing out soils. But here's the here's the big picture. Clean the carpet, right? Get it clean. Here's a question live from today. In business offices, what percentage of pathogen pollutants are brought in by people coming inside versus what comes from the built environment? So um, this might be a Doug question. I don't know. I don't know if I know that answer. I think it would okay. be a Dr. John question, maybe. Dr. John. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm gonna, and I'm going to give the, it depends. So um, if you've clearly got a contaminant source in the building, um, building related illness, you've got moldy filters, as, as, as Doug was saying, or you've got contaminated air conditioning liquids or something else, mold, stacky, buttress, and um, then it's going to be the building will be the issue. But I suppose the important point the question is making is that people will build, will bring in allergens. They'll bring in things on their shoes. Um, they obviously can uh, uh, exhale. They can be infectious. Um, I mean, a lot of the aspects of ASHRAE 241 looks at ventilation and air exchange and things like that. But like anything, like avoiding allergens, it's source control. So it's wearing a face covering. And one of the things that, that they there's a lot of debate about is you don't wear a face covering because you're going to stop yourself getting uh, infected and um, maybe you've got an n91 mask or something like that but then you've got to do fit testing etc you're wearing a face covering it's not a mask it's a face covering to stop you having other people getting infected as it were um, and people don't realize i wear i wear my mask for the elderly person in my office i don't wear my mask for me as it were so again the, the takeaway of the question is people can bring in pathogens and they can be carriers of pathogens themselves and we need to look at that but the building also then can be a source of, of pathogens as well so i suppose in source control strategy think of the building and people in the building consider too what the exact ratio depends on the situation appreciate that hey bethany we have one that maybe you hear about you deal with asbestos and content um materials correct that Yes, yeah, so, yep. Does radon ever come up in conversation? I mean, it does, um, to be honest, but I mean, I feel like that's something that's kind of up for debate. I mean, t t when it comes to asbestos, it's right. If you're not, if you're not touching it, you're not disturbing it. And it's really not a big problem. I mean, people all across live in homes that are, they still have it um, here in the U S and I know it's different around the world, but we only have a regulation, right? Like there are still building materials that we mm -hmm. use today. Um, so it's asbestos is definitely always going to be a tricky situation until there is a complete ban across everywhere <laughs> you know um the the debate that we have in the u.s is that i've worked in a few states now for what i do for for work um and it's it's different everywhere so originally from washington states i mean you don't touch a single thing during the beginning of mitigation because of the possibility of asbestos um but here in arizona it's under different regulations and now there's only certain years that we test for asbestos so I feel like until there is a complete ban or regulation across the board, I mean, it's always going to be something that we have to deal with. Mm -hmm. So asbestos, that's a hot topic itself. Uh, and thank you for sharing that. I remember where I lived earlier in my life, an entire neighborhood was shut down because of radon coming into homes. 
Is that something, Doug, you hear much about? Or is it a topic that's not worth talking about? Yeah, we hear about it in those states where there is a, a big issue. Of course, in Louisiana, we don't have much of a problem with radon, and Florida didn't have very much of a problem. You know, the South, we don't have an issue, but absolutely in the North, uh, that's part of typically part of uh, indoor air quality assessment mm -hmm. uh, if it's in a state where there's a special problem. So for sure, yeah. So that <laughs> segues. Oh, go ahead, John. Go ahead. Yeah, no, it's just an interesting point on radon because obviously, particularly in the west of Ireland, we have a lot of granite, so we get radon in buildings and basements and buildings and things like that. And people generally think radon is only where there's granite and it's only basement of houses. But there are cases of radon in skyscrapers because people may take granite or other rocks that contain a radon and grind it up in the cement mix and it gets poured in and they go into skyscrapers. So there are cases of public people, you know, way, way up in a skyscraper in Manhattan where you think there's no way there's going to be radon up here and you can get it. So, I mean, it's less so. It's more like that cigarette sign we had at the beginning, those, you know, asbestos, radon, they're kind of toxicants and hazards and building code and lead is another one. They're kind of more historical, but they're still around. Lead is still a big, big problem. But I think going forward, it's going to be more infectious aerosols, bio burden, mold, allergens, moisture, those issues. They're still around and we see them and they do turn up surprisingly, I say, in skyscrapers. But it's probably more of a historical thing like the cigarette smoking. Mm -hmm. I, I think what we're getting from this is there are so many things that can impact indoor air quality that you can't really talk about all of them. But you want to have you want to embrace the concept that there are so many of them. And we want to know what they are in the buildings that we're in. To that point, one of the questions from our uh, attendees today is, since every environment is different, will we ever be able to regulate or legislate into air quality? So, yeah. thoughts there? I'll, well, I'll take that one. Um, well, I'll, I'll try and kick off with it. <laughs> no, you won't. You won't have a one size fits all because how could you have somebody who lives in Arizona and somebody lives in Ireland? So you have climate zones and building code, um, but you will need to customize and buildings are buildings. Why different? different building uh, products are used, you've got different amounts of rainfall, you've got different amounts of, of, of heat sinks and heat recovery and electrification. So it, it never will be one size fits all, but that's why you need to monitor outdoor air. I see in the chat, people have talked about outdoor air quality related to ventilation exchange, indoor, outdoor balancing air. Can you open windows and allergy seasons and so forth? So it's a complicated area and there won't be a standard one size fits all regulation because the world's a big place and America's a big place. But just because it's variable doesn't mean we can't have best practice. And as Doug said earlier, it's not something that happens overnight, but it's something why this, this call is so important. We all have a role to play in and you've got to work at it continuously. Yeah. If I could comment, uh, one of the things that we've got to consider as well is the sensitivity of the individual that's living in that environment. And it's interesting to me that, um, I mean, we all know that in a, in a marriage, sometimes the wife senses the odor and the husband doesn't. We're all so different. And some people are very sensitive to the environment. So in, in 2004, when we started Normie, about, they, they estimated, they said five to 6% of the population was considered uh, sensitized individuals. Now they're saying it's probably closer to 20 or 25%, either sensitized individuals or they have the potential to be, uh, whether it's genetic or whatever that is. Dr. John probably knows a more, way more about that than I do. But what's interesting to me is that you think about that, walking down the street, that's every fourth house. Somebody might be sensitized to that environment. And that's if there's only one person in each house. That's a huge number. And what that means is that speaks to exactly what Dr. John said. Every unique, every environment is unique. Every individual is unique. That it, You have to tailor the solution to that specific person in that specific environment. Thank you for that, uh, Doug. Another question is about furnace or duct cleaning, what impact that has on indoor quality. I would assume it's like carpet cleaning if you keep it clean. But have you seen some extreme examples of how duct work or furnace system? You mentioned the filters earlier, Doug, but what yeah. about the, I don't know what you call them, the, the duct systems itself? Yeah, the um, quite a few problems, of course, in the in the uh, built environment with duct systems. They're not sized properly sometimes. Uh, in, in the South, we use a lot of flex duct, uh, which I would never have in my house. It uh, looks like an accordion. 
It has a it, it, great uh, opportunity to, to trap stuff inside the duct. And so, and it's uh, often things you can't clean. So duct cleaning is a very, you gotta be very careful about how that's done. Uh, but we see it all the time. If a house is older than 10 or 15 years, typically because of that blow by problem I was talking about with mm -hmm. the filters, now the ducts are gonna be dirty. Um, I think that's one of the hazards of our uh, of our industry is when we go into a, a restaurant, we look up at the grill and we see what's coming out of the supply register and we think, hmm, should I be eating here? <laughs> yeah, I no, I definitely agree with that. Honestly, Doug, if I can uh, jump in here, is that like duck cleaning, especially with the industry for remediation, I do regularly. I mean, if that is in your home, we've done pre-testing, why wouldn't you want to get your ducks clean? And it's, it's, amazing the amount of people that are like oh well that that doesn't matter well it really does like we have we have analytic data that backs up that you have these mold spores in your home let's do something about it so that you're not just slapping a band-aid on it you're not just removing the materials that you think are the problem let's get the full clean air system functioning and back to where it should be thank you for having that that's something your company does as well i believe um, we work closely with a lot of companies. I do want to okay. incorporate it just because it is so important. You know, we do the remediation all the way through, except for that part. And I feel like that's probably one of the most important parts of it. Agreed. We are officially over time. So let's respect our webinar attendees uh, time today. But we have one more question. We, you can all comment on it. I think it's one that's very fitting to close on because uh, this is something that has to happen. And I think it was alluded to earlier about the headaches and the stuffiness that some might have in a building. Uh, here's the question. Some in our building complain about their allergies and they feel we have allergens causing the issue. As a facility management crew, we don't think we have an issue. We do all we can to keep the air clean. What can we do about this? My, kind of a communication issue, maybe. John, you want to start? Yeah, yeah, it's a complicated one. I just go back to the duct cleaning. I think that's a good segue into having monitors and when duct cleaning is taking place is the high levels of dust and then do you need to leave the house when it's happening and come back in and surface vacuum any dust and stuff like that. That's an you know, example of somebody getting proactive and involved. And it's similar to the allergen question. I mean, it's a clinical question. So is it part of their occupational hygiene folks? Do they have a, a, a physician on staff or part of a, a nurse that could come in? But what are the people allergic to? And have they gone, you know, skin prick testing? Because you can only have an allergic reaction. So are you proven to be allergic to a common indoor trigger? And then is that common indoor trigger showing up in your environment? And there's a company, uh, Indoor Biotechnology, they call InBio now, Martin Chapman. Um, he has rapid test kits that do 12 or 20. It's a multiplex Araya amino assay test where you can, he'll send out rapid kits to you or you can do a quick vacuum sample and then from carpets and from walls and send it to his lab and he'll give you about 12 to 20 common allergens cockroach mulberry pollens fell d1 which is cat dust mite allergens and so forth and um, so and you could run that and do the science so there, there is a kind of a process map and a step-by-step -step way you can do an investigative process and rule out and rule in things so without it without a doubt there's an evidence-based way you can follow uh, an investigative path very yeah, good I, I think i would add to that I, one of the things you don't want to do is ignore the potential liability to someone's complaint and uh if somebody's feeling like they've got something in the environment, that's their reality. And as uh, Dr. John said, the best way to figure out if there's a problem or not is some type of assessment. And that doesn't necessarily have to be done by a professional. Um, he mentioned one device. We, we talked some about the air answers device. You can actually rent that uh, and you can put it in the environment for five days and they have a great panel uh, that that talks about all the different types of allergens that they might have found and beta glucan and a lot of options. So anyway, there's there's a lot of DIY kits out there and uh, more, more than happy to help people kind of navigate through that uh, jungle. But there are I don't think you can ignore it. I, I guess that's what I'm saying. I think I would take anybody's complaint seriously. Very good point. Bethany, anything to add to John and Doug's comments there? No, honestly, I think they covered it very well. I agree. Good information. 
Well, let's make this a wrap. I, I really appreciate Doug, Bethany, and John, your time today. I know, John, it's past dinner time for you, maybe close to bedtime. I don't know. But thank you for staying on. Uh, in Ireland, it's what time is it there, John? It's just gone uh, seven minutes past eight, eight o'clock. Oh, not too bad. All right. So hopefully, I'm going to try and watch. If the weather's not too bad, you don't have Irish weather, I'm going to try and watch a bit of the, the golf. I, uh, on the masters. The masters. So that's what I'm going to do after this. Well, enjoy that. But all of you, thank you for your time today. And everyone that was here, we appreciate you spending an hour and a bit more with CMM and ISSA and our panelists today as we talk about indoor quality. We'll probably do this again. Stay tuned. Thank you.